Hey everybody, Alex Kazura, SteelersDepot.com, back with some Pittsburgh Steelers analysis. It's been a little while since our last season in review episode, but now that the draft is over and we're kind of sitting in the dead of the offseason, wanted to go back and review some of the good, bad, ugly, and just an overall feel for how some Steelers performed in 2020. One player in particular I've been really wanting to do a video on is the guy we're talking about today, that Steelers offensive tackle, Chuck Wuma, core for as we sit here today, probably going to be your left tackle for week one against Buffalo in 2021. Started 15 games last season for Pittsburgh after replacing Zach Banner, who tore his ACL late in the week one opener against the Giants. So as we've been doing in this series, we'll look at the strengths, weaknesses, and an overall review and analysis of offensive tackle Chuck Wuma, a core for. beginning with the good of Chuck Wuma, a core four. When looking at a core four, you know, last year, third year guy, first year as a, you know, long-term full-time starter after replacing Zach Banner, when things came together perfectly, when the hands and feet were working, you know, dependently with each other in concert with each other, and whenever he kind of showed and flashed those tools that got him drafted in the third round back in 2018, he did have some really impressive reps. So here is a core for the right tackle against Jacksonville in week 11 and working against Josh Allen. I just like the set overall start to finish. The hands, the feet working together, the placement, the feet not stopping, and he just controls this rep from start to finish. Um, again, so important to have your hands right. If your hands are in good place, but you're able to take control of the block, you're initiating contact, you're getting into the chest of uh, the pass rusher, and he gets Allen in a really bad spot as, as a pass rusher there. So just to kind of go back and look at this thing again, um, you're going to see a core four win early. If you win early as an offensive lineman, you're almost guaranteed uh, to win the rep. And so hands inside, good leverage. And then I think Allen's trying to break the hand right there, but he's not in good good uh, position. And a core four is able just to stall this rush out pretty easily, keeps his feet moving the whole way through. And, uh, you know, just a, I think probably maybe his best pass pro rep the entire season. Uh, this is a really strong rep here against Allen, who was a pro bowler. His rookie season, granted, had a Bit of a down year, a sophomore year, I think he had injuries, played about half the season, but just really good job here of um, building his house, getting in his pass set quickly, getting, you know, depth and width, good hand placement, keeping his feet moving, and just, I think, dominates his rep. Looking back here to week five against the Philadelphia Eagles, here is a core four matched up against left defensive end Brandon Graham. One phrase I've seen and, and heard commonly used by some guys who really know offensive line play well is the idea of turning a wide nine into a tight five, basically meaning that, you know, you're not going to just set normally and let a, you know, pass rusher would have all this kind of time and space and opportunity to, to build up his rush and let him come into your chest. And so the Steelers, and I profess I don't watch the rest of the NFL as much as I do Pittsburgh, and I don't have a good way to quantify this, but they probably use more short and jump sets than any other team in football. We'll see how that looks under new O-line coach Adrian Clem, but especially guy like Phil Nueva, obviously no longer with the team, but you're going to see a core for on this play, be able to take Graham from that wide nine and kind of set vertically and be aggressive with his pass set here and win that battle really, really quickly. So look at it here. Instead of getting a lot of depth, they're setting 45 degrees or a vertical set, what the Steelers use commonly as well. I'm going to get aggressively in the Graham's pads and kind of stop that battle immediately so he's not able to build up speed and have kind of a full uh, head of steam attacking a core four. And a good punch here, strong punch here. Don't always see that from a core four in this game. But a nice job here to attack early, be aggressive, have a good punch, and just kind of thwart that rush almost immediately. And Graham's hands are high. You know, Core 4 has lower hands here, gets into Graham's chest, pushes him back, and blows him back a little bit. And, uh, you know, a lot gives Ben the clean pocket there for the incompletion to James Washington. But just want to look at the set here one last time here quickly. And so, you know, often you'll see, you know, Lyman take a vertical set or, you know, a, a wider 45 degree angle kick set for a core for here. It's one set to get with, and then he's going to be aggressive and, and attack instead of being the, you know, the catcher and catching the pass rush. He's going to be aggressive here. I like that that approach. And so and that's on the offensive line coach in, in some ways, but good execution here from a core for to kind of shut down this battle early and win it versus Brandon Graham. Week 16 versus the Colts, and like this matchup and this result here against the uh, Colts left defensive end, and just kind of run this thing through. Just being patient with the set there, and just, you know, being uh, building a good base, and just having good hands, and not getting overextended, and just, you know, it doesn't look fancy, and it's not supposed to as an offensive lineman. If it just looks clean and you do your job, then 
you know, that's that's what gets you paid really in the NFL. So just kind of go through this thing here quickly. Um, initially, you're going to get more of a vertical set here. I think the Steelers do that commonly versus three techs to their side. You won't see Bill Noiva do it here because they way this uh, over front is shifted to the Steelers' right side, the defense's left side here. So initially, you're going to get a vertical set to protect against any stunts or games. And you'll see a core four, not with his eyes here, but the backside hand, you know, making sure there isn't any sort of game or twist or, you know, strong penetration coming from the three tech here. I believe that's DeForest Buckner. And as soon as he feels nothing coming, no sort of game being run, then he's going to get. Uh, his hands up and then attack the left defensive end. He's trying to chop the hands right there. A core for able to keep his base and just a really, you know, simple, strong base there from uh, core four and a, a good pass per rep. So, again, nothing too fancy there, but a good set um, with a vertical set there initially and then a good punch, maintain his base, win the rep. Ben gets the pass off. A core four isn't known as a strong run blocker. We'll look at some of those negative clips here in a moment, but I do like this rep here against the Colts, still uh, the same week 16 game against, you know, all pro linebacker Darius Lander. And this is not a successful play overall for the Steelers offense, which is uh, not a surprise because it's a gunning ball and it's being in a short yarded situation, but to a core four specifically, and again, it's nothing crazy or fancy. He's got leverage and ankle here working against a guy who's much smaller than him, but a core four, good job there. Um, with the angle and, you know, being able to knock Leonard to the ground. That's a good rep there. Leonard's not a guy who's on the ground quite a bit. Again, pretty ugly play all around. And maybe you could argue that he could have, you know, come down on the D-tackle here. Don't think that was his responsibility on this play with the, the late shift. But uh, a core four, nice job there. Good, strong uh, punch there. Knocks Leonard down. And had this play been successful, let's say the catcher was able to win that block, then I think Benny Snell probably runs uh, off a of core four's hip there and into the end zone. But that did not happen, and that's kind of, emblematic of this uh, terrible run game in 2020. Now we'll look at the bad with Chakuma, a core for. Steelers arch nemesis, third and one. See it here, third and one against Houston, and down by four. They do not convert. Stop me if you heard that one before. But we'll look at exactly why in this play in a core four is one of the reasons why this play was not successful. Second level climb here to the linebacker. McKinney, and he's just not able to execute it, just lunges and uh, just kind of hands over feet, misses the block, and McKinney's able to be the first man in. Other issues on the play, sure, but McKinney, the first guy in there to tackle. I believe that's Anthony McFarland. So check it out here again, just lunging. There's no power. And McKinney's able to easily slip the block right here, get into the backfield, kind of force uh, McFarland laterally. Again, other issues on the play, sure, but uh, that is, I think, the primary problem. There and so core four, you'll kind of see that a lot in these clips and a theme throughout the season. A lot of lunging, a lot of hands over feet, and just not always playing with a great base. He's not a you know inherently big or powerful guy relative to the position either, so he's got to play with really good technique. He does not do so here, and it results in no gain, and the Steelers unsuccessful on third and one. Looking at a core four in some pass sets here versus Denver, going to match up here against number 99, and you just kind of see him lunging and not playing with a great base here, and you know I think that's probably been one of his biggest issues, why he's losing some of that power and, and ultimately losing some of these battles. Um, as soon as he gets eyes on number 99 here, he's going to punch, a core four is going to lean, and you're going to see him, I think, probably get too wide with his base A and then be kind of that waist bender as well, and he loses that battle really quickly. 299 is going to swim over the top of him, Ball gets out, not an issue for Ben on this play. You do keep him wide. I guess that's a, a small, the smallest of victories there for an offensive lineman. Better to have exterior outside pressure than pressure up the middle. But just McCore for, I think, needing, and this is early in, in the career uh, of him. This was in uh, week two, actually, his first actual start. But not a good rep here. And just him getting, I think, too wide and too heavy, uh, top heavy, and then losing that rep pretty quickly and pretty easily. On this play, staying with the Broncos game week two, I just see a processing issue. This is going to be, I believe, yeah, this is third and 10 versus Denver. They're going to bring pressure here with safety Justin Simmons coming up. I believe it's going to be the B gap here between Kevin Dotson and a core four. Slide protection on this play is going to be to the left, so you're going to have Pouncey, Filer, and Villanueva to the left side with Dotson, a core four, Condor in for uh, pass protection on the right side. Eventually, and, and you'll see it here in a second, they're going to try to overload this thing and bring uh, the safety late as they, you know, Ben's able to get him with the hard camp, but they still aren't bringing the pressure there with 31. Justin Simmons always been in the thorn in the Steelers side, block field goals, block passes, etc. And so they're going to bring what one more than what the Steelers can block here on this play. And so it's a tough spot to be in. There's going to be pressure allowed. That's inevitable uh, at this point, even with Connor staying in. They're going to bring ultimately six guys. Steelers actually have six to block, but the way this gets blocked up gets overloaded on this right side. So again, three to this side. They drop the away side. Uh, linebacker, 
and they're going to bring four to this side. So the Steelers are simply outnumbered. And the way you're taught here when you're outnumbered is you have to work inside out. So I know, you know, when you make the decision of do you want to block Tristan Simmons or a, an outside linebacker, but inherently a pass rusher, you would think the pass rusher, but you want to block inside out, uh, inside out. And so on this play, the core four does not do that. Connor picks up the linebacker. No one picks up Simmons. The core four takes the widest rusher to his side and Simmons comes in free and bats down this pass and the Steelers have to punt. So you do want to work inside out if you should have come down and taken Simmons, that would have left you know the edge rusher open. But again, that interior pressure gets right in the throwing lane for Ben, and the pass is incomplete and nearly could have been intercepted. So just a, a small processing issue on this play against his overload blitz. Again, first uh, official start of the season for a core four, but uh, not a good process and read on this play. This example here, final one with the core four, it's going to be a bad rep here against Ryan Kerrigan of Washington football team. Nearly, uh, I shouldn't say nearly, but still showed interest in signing Kerrigan this offseason. Maybe this rush is one reason why core four, just two high hands here. I know he lacks power and his punch isn't great. I think that's one reason because he's not an inherently strong guy or a big guy necessarily overall. But I think the the poor hand placement, the inconsistent pass uh, hand placement is one reason why he loses some of that power. Hand just simply too high here. Hamilton's able to break him, get into his chest, and that's just a really ugly rep there. Just simply overwhelms and overpowers a core of four on third and three. Luckily, the ball's coming out quick on this little pivot route here by Juju, but uh, core of four, just a really bad punch here. Loses that power, gets, you know, absolutely pancake taken to the ground. Kerrigan getting pressure on the quarterback, but because of the third and three situation, the Steelers just, uh, you know, inherent nature of getting the ball out quickly. In 2020, Ben had the quickest snap to release time in the NFL. Uh, no harm, no foul, ultimately, but uh, this could have been a bad rep had that ball not gotten out, and it's just still a bad rep overall because it's just too high hands and just completely lacking that power that I think has been an issue throughout his career. So overall, my final thoughts on Chuck Woodmore core for beginning with the good, I would say I do like his overall lateral mobility, his quickness out of a stance. I think he's an athletic guy overall. That kind of goes to my next point of him being toolsy. I think he can show good hands, good feet. He flashes good sets, as we saw that set against Jacksonville with Josh Allen. Easily uh, his best of the season and just kind of an A-plus rep, no matter who uh, you're considering that is. And in terms of the context, if that was by, you know, Joe Thomas in his prime, it would have looked, I think, almost the exact same. So when it comes together, it can look really good for core four. Then there's his versatility. Now, hopefully he won't have to show that versatility this season. He'll be, you know, projected as your starting left tackle for the Steelers in 2021. But, he, you know, 15 games started at right tackle this past season. Uh, played left tackle at Western Michigan, so he's got, I think, the versatility to play either spot and has a lot of experience now playing either tackle spot. I would probably bet he's more comfortable at left tackle because he did it for two, three years um, at Western Michigan, so that probably helps um, him you know, in terms of a comfort factor, but now he has that versatility with good amount of starting experience at left tackle and right tackle. And then finally, just room to grow. Um, again, fourth year guy, uh, you know, really only a, a one year long time, long term starter for Pittsburgh last season. wasn't even the starter out of the gate, obviously in 2020. Um, but I don't think he's a finished product yet. And I think you'll see some of those tools if things come together. Maybe something with new offensive line coach Adrian Clem and assistant Chris Morgan can kind of take his game to the next level. But I don't think he's quite a finished product yet. For the bad of Chuck Wilma, a core four, I just think he's underpowered overall. I don't think that's going to change significantly this season or the rest of his career. He's going to be more of a finesse tackle than he is going to be a baller, super physical guy. Overall, just lacks power. His punch is weak, so to work on his hand placement, too inconsistent. If he can't keep his hands inside or low enough, he's going to lose a lot of battles because he doesn't have the inherent size or strength to be able to stall out some of these power rushers. Um, again, hand placement inconsistent. That's going to be an issue because it kind of compounds that lack of strength uh, overall. I would say as a run blocker at best, he's kind of a stalemate, stall out, run blocker, kind of get in the way, use leverage angles, and that's fine. But he's not going to get a great push on the run game overall. And I think him playing left tackle will mitigate that to some extent than where he was at right tackle last season, but certainly not going to be uh, a top five or ten run blocking tackle and then finally, I think he can get over aggressive sometimes and, and be too top heavy, you know, being a waist bender, uh, lunging too much, not being quite as patient as he needs to be. So certainly some work to, to do there. I think he just kind of plays a little too aggressive, a little too top heavy overall. Again, when it comes together, it looks good, but I think he needs to just be more consistent with his pass sets in a lot of ways. And I think lunging and shooting his hands too early and just betting at the waist is one of those issues I see uh, a bit too often on his tape. So overall, 2021, a big season for Chuck Wuma Corfor. I think everyone knows that, including Corfor himself. He'll have the chance, I presume, to be the Steelers' 
starting left tackle. And if he plays well at the end of his rookie contract, he will get paid. I know the lines in terms of uh, the talent level and, and the you know requirement for the skill set is really blurred between left tackle and right tackle. But left tackles still get paid and right tackles do not get paid as much as left tackles. You look at the top 16 paid tackles in, in football, 14 of them are left tackle. So you play left tackle, you're going to get paid more than you will on the right side. So of course, for moving the left tackle, we'll have that opportunity to get paid uh, quite a bit of money. Maybe not top 14 type money, but he'll certainly get paid well if he has a strong year, either, either by Pittsburgh or by somebody else. So big season coming for a core four. Excited to see him. You know, I think really having that, that full year, basically full year, 15 games, just being a starter um, to, to make mistakes, to learn, grow, to now work with a new offensive line coach, new uh, assistant offensive line coach, and really get a good feel for what kind of player a core four is or isn't. This is going to be make or break for him. And so we'll see how he grows. I'm not going to presume or assume what the season will look like for him. We're just going to find out together and we'll certainly be re- recapping and reviewing that throughout 2021. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll talk to you soon.